So the title of the session is community-led monitoring more than just another buzzword. Um, and my name is Annie Madden. I'm a project lead at the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, or INPUT, and I'm going to hand over to my co-chair to introduce himself and to say a few words to open the session. Hi, everybody. My name is Ernst. I work with an NGO called Mitsan Monde. It seems we're trying to break a record here with um, bringing in more people. Let's, let's, let's try that at least. I hope everybody had a, a, a great conference, and congratulations, you made it so far. So. The first thing I want to say that, that this whole session is entirely be organized by Annie. I just sit here to take the credit for it, as a white middle-aged man usually do. So that's my that's my role in here. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, we we wanted to to cover the subject of CLM because, to be perfectly honest with everybody. Um, it, the term came more and more to my attention, and I realized that I didn't really understand what it really was or what it was about. The words seem simple, but I, there's, there's a whole concept behind it. So then we decided to make a whole session for me to understand CLM. So it, you're all welcome to sit in the session, but it's really just for my understanding, this, the, <laughs> this session. But on a, on a more s serious note, um, as, as an implementer, Mitsan Monde, we, we implement harm reduction in, in several countries. And it, it, a few years ago, let, even five to seven years ago, you, you could come and present about your programs. And if you would present activities that were peer-based, you would get an applause from the audience as in, wow, that is a real community involvement there. And the world has l luckily moved on. And we are now looking into really catching up with the reality. And as an implementer, that we are not a community-led organization, we need to be very careful where we position ourselves and to make sure that we are at, at the very least accountable to the community we work with. And it's, a very, it's very easy to say this in these nice rooms and, and use beautiful words around it, but the reality um, is always very complex because as a provider, you, you, you provide your services, but then often people work very hard, they're very defensive about what they're doing, and at the same time, there's a power disbalance between you as, as an implementer and the people that would like to uh, take benefit of your services. So it, it's a very complex um, subject, ultimately, and we really are committed to try and get this right. So for MDM, community-led monitoring is I think the first thing that comes to my mind is about accountability. And that's where, as an implementer, I'm, I'm standing and looking into the community-led monitoring at this point, but I'm hoping that during the session, I will learn more, more and, and see what other components it can bring to us as, a, as an um, organization who implements harm reduction. So I'll hand it back over to Annie and uh, roll through some amazing presentations from the best panel in this entire conference, and then we will go to Q&A at the end. Thanks, Ernst. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to get straight into our first speaker, who is Keith uh, Mianis from the Global Fund. Uh, Keith, due to other duties, all related to CLM, it needs to be said, is traveling and is unable to be here in person. So we've organized a pre-record with Keith. We thought this was really important to kick off with the Global Fund talking about. Keith is from the community um, rights and gender team. Uh, at the Global Fund, and uh, really the Global Fund's one of the key donors that have really been doing quite a lot of work in advancing CLM with key populations. So we'll play the pre-recorded uh, piece with, uh, I'll open, uh, you'll see I'll open with Keith and introduce him and then he'll do a series of slides and then we'll come back to our live presenters. Okay, um, hi everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure actually to introduce uh, Keith Mianis, who is the Senior Tec Technical Advisor uh, for the Community Rights and Gender Team at the Global Fund. Um, welcome, Keith. Uh, it's so great to have you here. Uh, you. you know, look, particularly because this is the first time really that we've had a significant conversation about community led monitoring or CLM at INSU and especially given 
your expertise in this space and all the work that Global Fund has been doing uh, in this area to sort of advance the CLM agenda, so particularly among key populations globally. So we don't have a lot of time today, so I'm going to sort of jump straight into it and hand over to you to go through your slides and give us a bit of an overview of the work that uh, Global Fund have been doing on CLM, and then we might pop back at the end for a couple of quick questions. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Annie, and, and good morning, everybody. Apologies that I can't be there in person, uh, um, but I'm happy that we could pre-record the session and, and take you through some of the slides. So excited to be invited and, and really think this is a great opportunity for us to share some insights um, and also learn from you about community-led monitoring at the Global Fund. So several of you might have seen this slide. Um, the Global Fund Strategic Framework from 2023 to 2028. And the only reason I'm showing you this um, is to emphasize and highlight the importance of civil society and communities to achievement of this strategy. You'll see that there are several mutually reinforcing contributory objectives to which community-led monitoring, community system strengthening, and community-led and based responses to service delivery are essential and critical to help us achieve these objectives. What does this look like in practice? And I really just wanted to show you how CLM is being recognized as a legitimate social accountability mechanism and approach that the Global Fund believes uh, contributes to more resilient and sustainable health systems, but at the same time also really allows us to action and realize the people-centeredness in how services are being delivered. You'll see in the description and definition that beyond health, um, or and or human rights types of monitoring and issues. CLM can also be used for a variety of other initiatives and issues like financial and programmatic design and decision making, health financing, monitoring, for instance, or water and sanitation and, and soon pandemic preparedness and responses. CLM is highlighted in every single information note, which is fantastic. I think it's recognized as a programmatic essential for us to be able to achieve what, what the Global Fund investments are meant to achieve and to respond against national strategic plans. I won't delve into these, but just to note that for each of these disease areas, as well as for resilient and sustainable systems for health, the value add of CLM is pretty well described and it links really well to programmatic objectives and priorities. Of course, on the far right, there's the technical brief on community system strengthening with a lot more detail on CLM itself, um, the mechanism, the design name, and so on. So as a reminder, community systems and responses fits and includes CLM. If you think about community-led responses, they also fall on a spectrum, typically those that are delivered and provided and supported through the government to those that are completely outside of the government structures. The systems that underpin all these different responses are then the boxes at the bottom uh, right of the screen, and you'll see the red one, particularly community-led monitoring. I'll show you in a second how we've updated the language in this cycle uh, to reflect latest evidence and to also align to technical partner and agencies so that we have one coherent uh, definition of community-led monitoring and doesn't cause further confusion and frustration. While CLM is not a new intervention, I feel like the way we've been doing it as a multilateral donor is new how we are thinking about investments in community-led monitoring in relation to disease priorities or health system weaknesses is becoming increasingly important and I think clearer as well. At the level of um, the countries, what we are noting just from the previous or the cycle we are currently in as we are preparing for GC7, you see a variety of budgets um, costing CLM and oftentimes mostly insufficiently 
um, you will see budgets ranging from, you know, $1,000 to cover a whole set of sites to multi-million dollar investments in CLM. So it's still an area where there's still some guidance needed, but we do have one guidance note and I will, I will share that with you later on costing. As CLM is evolving and as CLM is growing um, and differentiated amongst the communities, and here we are talking particularly about people using inject drugs, um, there is a big risk of the proliferation of approaches and models. I call it the mushrooming of CLM. Um, oftentimes, you know, as a community uh, or as a, um, a population group, we would set up priorities and want to monitor things that are important to us. And that is valid and, and, and supportive. At the same time, it's important we think about how, how does this come together? Because all of us can sit on little piles of data, but I think the power lies in how we bring some of those issues together, because there are so many things we share as a gay community, as a P-word community, um, as a youth or adolescent community. There remains a lack of understanding, but I must admit, you know, I'm saying this um, because there has been so much done on building the capacity of people's knowledge and understanding of what is community-led monitoring, what is it not, how to do it, um, who's in charge, why are they in charge, what is your role versus my role. And I think a lot of that has been addressed, but, I, but, but you know, in my honest opinion, I understand that the appreciation and value add of CLM is not yet so clear to those we are targeting with the issues that needs to be resolved. So that's definitely an area we are thinking about doing better in in the next grant cycle and, and, and I have been um, you know supporting countries to think through that. Then just to say finally, one of the challenges that we are seeing is you know Global Fund is the most prominent donor in community-led monitoring followed by the U.S. government, PEPFAR, CDC, USAID, and, 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 and others, um, we are seeing at the level of the country oftentimes that there's a lack of coordination, that some partners are funding or supporting a CLA mechanism of a particular location or community without bringing and connecting the dots. This contributes to the proliferation of approaches and models. It contributes to not understanding the full cost and resource allocation to CLM, and it contributes to further confusion about what each and um, everybody's role um, implementing CLM. Um, so we have several work streams that we've been working hard at uh, over the last three years, supporting community-led monitoring in core HIV, TB, malaria, RSSH, and as well as COVID-19 response mechanism grants. You'll see on the left-hand side the mutual objectives between both of these mechanisms are to support the uptake and use of CLM, to strengthen its integration into diseases, and by that I mean really think about when we do quality assurance or DQAs or have conversations about whether health systems are responsive to people's needs, that we integrate the use of CLM data into those conversations as legitimate data um, and we use that as the evidence base for advocacy. And finally, because like I said, this is new for the Global Fund in this to generate some evidence and learning and understand a bit better about where things are going and how it's going and not. Several highlights to note, there's too many here, but I must admit we've been able to work in so many different contexts. Um, we've been able to do landscape assessments prior to the strategic initiative kicking off. Um, you know, it's funny because sometimes I think back to when I joined the Global Fund uh, in April 2020 and we were designing this investment case and looking for guidance and there were none and looking for resources and there were none and trying to talk to people and there weren't focal points at different agencies and entities to lead this type of work to where we are today, a vibrant community of practice, a pretty comprehensive resource hub um, increased investments in grants through TA to elevate this um, and to bring this forward. We now are talking about adaptations and, um, and, and flexibility in how CLM is monitoring impact of pandemics. 
um, there's the integration of SRH and human rights and stigma and discrimination. So it really has been a long road. And in just three years, you can see all the, all the results from just two years of investment. And this is tiny investments, right, in the bigger picture. It's really small. The CLMSI is a $3 million over three-year investment, whereas the C19 RM investment is $2 million over two years. So, And this is global support. So it just shows you that the dollar can stretch <laughs> um, if you are smart about it. And, and, and I think the lesson for me is that um, it's difficult to define TA needs well in advance, especially if you are trying to undertake a new type of work. And I think for PWED, um, and just following the input launch of the CLM guide yesterday, it's clear that you know this community is starting to think about how to improve their engagement um, through this mechanism. And so this is also near. And, 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 and as you think about what you might need in two years' time, it's difficult to determine that. So we realize that demand-driven, reactive support is the most helpful um, in so many settings. So this is to give you a quick flavor of some of the guidance and resources that exist. I urge you to go to the ITPC hub, um, CLM hub, where all this is being placed in one place so we don't duplicate um, uh, uh, places where, where you can access these resources. There are videos, there are guides, different things that, that, that I think would be incredibly helpful. You'll see over here, all these resources are, are, of course, available in multiple languages, but all of them also touch on different types of uh, disease areas where my cursor is now. This is a community-led monitoring guide for civil society and malaria programming, for instance. On the left right of the screen, it goes into details for each of the cycle pieces of CLM. So you will hone in as opposed to talking about this really big beast without um, taking into consideration the nitty gritty details that needs to be ironed out. In February 2020, there was the first ever Global Fund convened meeting, um, and the title was Towards a Common Understanding of Community-Based Monitoring. Just two years later, we have updated language, we have built partnerships, and we were able to all meet in Bangkok in August of 2022 to discuss a global agenda for community-led monitoring. It was an exciting time. We had so much interest, um, participation from all over the world, all technical agencies and donors represented, foundations were present. So it was really great to, to be able to do that and, and come together to talk about it. I won't go into the details of what we did, but I think the outcome of what we tried to achieve was, was probably most important. You would have seen a white paper being published at that time uh, by civil society and technical partners, as well as the technical assistance providers. And it was a, a lengthy half-day conversation about where donors are falling short and having an honest conversation about that. But at the same time, also having an honest conversation about where civil society, technical agencies, and the TA providers can contribute in addressing those shortcomings. So these were some of the commitments we made um, what, a year ago, a year and a bit ago. Um, and so we are constantly following this up. In fact, we are having a, a donor coordination call this afternoon um, to assess on, on how far we've come on this. And again, these are structures and mechanisms that didn't exist before. So just to give you an indication that they are evolving and, and I would urge the PWID community at the global and regional levels, you know, to contribute and participate in those um, and to better understand it. So what's the way forward? Um, CLM in, in GC7 is both exciting and scary. <laughs> I was just telling um, somebody on the phone earlier this morning um, in Nigeria that you'd see on the left-hand side, and, and I mean, this data uh, has a lot of cash. GC6 approved grants of $26 million for community-led monitoring investments. And here I mean straight sort of black and white community monitoring um, investments, you know, within the modular framework as categorized, not the community empowerment interventions that might be within a P-word HIV prevention module. Um, and if you look at the bottom, GC7 requests, we're already at nearly $60 million in 44 countries. And that's just window one and two. Um, and, and so the caveat here is that a lot of these grants, this number comes from what countries prioritized in their funding request. A lot of those grants still need to be negotiated. 
I think embedding TA inside grants is the way to go. Um, the CLMSI is slated to end in December this year, so there won't be a dedicated pot of central TA from the Global Fund. We are dependent on donors and technical partners to support meet this gap. And, and, and just to say, you know, the, um, the partnerships we've built with the French, uh, with UNH TSM, uh, Backup Health and so on, has been incredibly helpful to make sure that we will be able to meet the demand going forward in light of not having a central fund. So I wanted to stop there and, and thank you again for your time. I hope this was helpful and I, I'm really happy to respond to, to any questions. Okay, um, that, that's Keith from the Global Fund. And now we've sort of heard that sort of strategic overview, I guess, from a multilateral donor. I think what we want to do from here is, after that framing, is to move into a series of shorter presentations uh, from our speakers who are going to talk more about CLM from uh, experience of implementation, from civil society perspective and from community perspective and to start talking about experiences and how people are doing CLM and what are some of the challenges involved ahead of having a, a wider Q&A discussion. So I'd like to move straight away to uh, our next speaker, uh, Dennis Boslevsky from the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition or ITPC for the um, ecoregion and uh, Dennis is going to talk about implementing CLM with key populations in Eastern Europe. Region. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very happy I was able to make it in person rather than virtual. And thank you all for coming and joining our session at the edge of the conference. <laughs> it uh, takes a lot of effort to come on the third day when you have such a beautiful city over there. Uh, so actually, I can talk a lot about CLM, and I don't really find it boring because my roots as an activist actually have started in CLM for many ways. And the important thing to remember is that for communities, like the thing that is now being called CLM has existed long before the donors wanted to put their attention on it and fund it and describe it and institutionalize it as they call it nowadays. Because uh, when I joined it, uh, the, the activism back in 2007, I think one of the first trainings I attended was on um, community budget monitoring and expenditures tracking, and it was organized by OSF. And it was basically uh, experts from the Central for Economic Governance uh, and Accountability in Africa teaching civil society from across the globe, uh, like why it is important to look at your government budget spendings and this will help you to actually find the money to, uh, and to justify the like, reallocations that can help fund your healthcare response. And uh, it was not a fancy, a fancy thing, nobody really like, talked about it much, but it led to quite a, few, uh, quite a few wonderful and significant changes. Uh, can we put the presentation on? Do I have to click? No, I think he's doing it. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I can, I can just continue with the intro. Um, I think what's important to remember when we talk about CLM uh, is that, again, there are many initiatives uh, that are not now being considered CLM in this institutionalized framework, and there are many arguments. Like, for example, there is the stigma index that many of you heard of. Like, in a way, it's a research. Is it CLM or not CLM? Or, for example, if there is a donor uh, program and they take the community organization to assess the effectiveness of the services that they are providing, is it CLM or is it not CLM? Like, how do we really define what's CLM and what is not? So I'm, I'm loving this example uh, that I think is very, very visual. So let's imagine we have an investor that invested a lot of money and built a wonderful house for 100 apartments. And uh, like people are living there, and for some time they are quite happy. But then uh, the investor comes, uh, and uh, he wants to, do, like, to check how the people are living in this wonderful house. And the, the inhabitants are well aware that the pipes are leaking because they're screwed, and it was a cheap material used 
when they were doing this house. Uh, and they say, oh, that's perfect that you want to, to, to check on how we are. We have these pipes leaking. And the investor says, well, I'm very sorry to hear that, but we actually currently are very much worried about the carbon imprint that we are making. So we are really willing to measure the effectiveness of the heating rather than the pipes. So that's what's going on when we have the community perspective, and when we have a donor perspective, which is an investor. So I think the important thing to remember when we talk about CLM uh, and the reason why it is called like led by the communities is that the communities should have the primary say in what they want to monitor and what, they, what the problem is. Um, so if, even if there are no slides, I'm going now to refer to some of the examples from Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Back in 2011, um, the big projects of the Global Fund were rolling out of the region, and they were rolling out of Russia, first of all, because it was a very uh, progressive country at the moment, uh, as it seemed to many, uh, and they were taking over with the national funding the international response on HIV, and they were taking over the treatment, so they had the national treatment program finally. But uh, the issue was that the Global Fund grant was over in 2011 with 11,000 people being on air treatment, and the national program had to roll them in next year, but they never planned it. So they never planned the budget to enroll additional 11,000 people on treatment. They planned the gradual growth, and they just didn't count on that. And they ignored the warnings from the civil society and the community, which led to huge stockouts, of course, obviously, uh, and people were not facing treatment. And that's when the activist groups came to, together and then came to regional networks and said, like, look, we guys have a huge problem. We need, we need to do something about that. And government was in denial, surprisingly, and they were saying everything is okay, and these are just single cases. So the community has established a very simple tool, the website, uh, that, is go, uh, that was called piriboy.ru, which is translated as stockouts. Uh, and uh, it, this website is v consuming very little traffic. It's very simple. People just get in there either from the mobile phone or they're going there from uh, the computer and they just leave a message which drug they're lacking, which city, and briefly describe the situation. Uh, it actually was able to help the community to really showcase the thing in media, and back at the days it was still possible to uh, give the alternative point of view to the media in Russia. Uh, and uh, then the countries surrounding Russia, like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Armenia, uh, and others, Moldova, they said, look, we also have stockouts, and we see that this tool is working. Can you guys please replicate it in our countries? So basically the community was the initiator of like what we want to do, what we want to solve. And obviously as I'm coming from the Treatment Preparedness Coalition, I'm talking right now about the um, treatment thing. Okay, this is what I'm talking about right now. And in parallel to that, also community started to really monitor uh, what's going on with the procurements, how many drugs government is planning to procure. And that was a huge issue because they really faced this problem. And it was continuous, even though the huge stockouts have stopped. But any, every now and then, and I think in your countries and with your communities, that's the case as well, that every now and then we have stockouts all around the globe with various um, you know, suppliers and due to various reasons. And the important thing about CLM is this cycle that I think is much more simply a way to describe of how it is. Uh, advocacy is a crucial part of it. You just don't do monitoring for monitoring. The case for the community-led monitoring is advocacy. And monitoring is the way to justify your cause. I think this is very important thing to remember. Uh, yeah. Also, community-led monitoring can, can be helpful in uh, the situations of crisis. Uh, also, this is an example how one thing is helping to lead to another and build on what's already there. 
when the COVID hit it in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, people started to write to this set of stock out website in various countries. And they were writing things like, okay, I am from Kenya or I'm from Israel and I got stuck in Kyrgyzstan because nothing is flying and I'm out of my ARVs, can you please help me? Or the Russian people who got stuck in EU or the Ukrainian people who got stuck in EU, they were writing to this website and saying, okay, I got stuck in EU, I don't know if I'm gonna tell that I'm HIV positive, are they going to put me to jail? Because this is a whole different background that people are having in terms of revealing their status. Uh, and that's how we were able to actually using this website to justify the cause and get the donations from the generic companies and start supplying these people literally physically with tablets, sending them by post, bringing them via the network of fellow activists and so on and so forth. And uh, then when the war heated between Russia and Ukraine, we used the same system to help the refugees, those who for certain reasons have decided to flee not to EU but to Russia because it was safer or because it was they were forced to to various reasons and until they were able to get their medications from the government or from whatever other source we were able to to help them using just a simple website so they could reach out a couple of closing points that I want to uh, mention about like overall concept of the CLM it was a great presentation from CRG, and I think CRG is the best part of the Global Fund understanding the whole concept of CLM, but even among donors, we often see that one pillar is not really understanding what the other pillar is doing, because quite often we face the comments from TRP that is assessing the applications to the Global Fund, and they would write things like, uh, please cut out all the CLM, and increase the service component and bring more indicators to the services. And you're like, okay, Jesus Christ. No, you just can't do that. Like your services are going to be blind without the CLM, especially if we are talking about oppressive governments and in oppressive governments uh, environment, CLM is a rare and sometimes only source of the alternative information that civil society still can provide uh, to the international community to inform the same donors or to inform international networks and so on and so forth. Um, and I think the last thing I want to mention is the role of the global networks, community networks and the regional networks. Uh, in my opinion, our role is to be in a way a buffer between the strict donor requirements that are happening sometimes and the needs of the community. Because for example, a donor comes to the network and says, okay, we have the investment to measure the carbon imprint or like we want to do the research on resistance uh, in, in this or that country. And our role is to say, okay, we don't know if this is an issue in this country. And our voice is sometimes much stronger than the voice of the country organization. And our role is to say, look, let us get back to our countries, check if this is an issue for them. And like, we are going to help them negotiate. So maybe instead of Belarus, you wanna do this research in Kyrgyzstan because for Belarus, it's not an issue. And for Kyrgyzstan, it's an issue. So you need to really, you know, adjust your approach. So I'm urging the, the, the representative of the big network organization to, to do that when you can and the donors to, to really hear these voices from the region. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, that was brilliant. And I apologize for your slides, uh, but there was a problem with the link, I believe, um, wasn't working. So thank you for carrying on and giving us such a great uh, presentation and overview. So I'm going to move on uh, to the next speaker, um, with, who will be Tracy Swan. And Tracy's on the INSU board, but she's also a global consultant and has been working with INPUD in relation to its uh, recently published CLM guide. And Tracy's going to speak about supporting communities to engage in CLM. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for turning up, especially after last night's party and since this is the last day of the meeting. So I've worked on a lot of different CLM initiatives, and my main role has been as an information sharer or educator. 
So I'm going to talk about what CLM is, what its core principles are, why we're doing it, um, and the role of people who use drugs in their networks and organizations historically in advocacy and services. Um, aspects of CLM, the foundation of CLM and CLM questions, and how the context really matters for people who use drugs. And I'm going to do this all very quickly. I didn't know that Angela McBride would be sitting right next to me, but when I interviewed her, she gave the best quote, if you remember anything, it's taking the evidence and actioning it. We all know what happens to a lot of reports. They wind up in the wastebasket or in a drawer. So what is CLM? Really, it's just a formal routine mechanism that is funded for what communities of people who use drugs and other key populations have been doing forever, like collecting and sharing information about human rights violations, what's not going right in their programs, and access to and quality of services. With CLM, there's a direct link to the information that's collected to advocacy with key stakeholders and duty bearers. And the point is to make services better, to increase access and quality, and to push for better policies that against stigma discrimination, to advance decriminalization policy, and to advance human rights and uphold people's dignity. So why is it being implemented? Because everybody really noticed we have all these services, but they're not as good as they should be. I just added a formal quote from WHO to this effect, you know, just to increase the force of the slides. And I think in the beginning services for people who use drugs, you could really say nothing for us without us because the rest of the world really wasn't doing anything. And people who use drugs and their organizations and networks have been at the forefront of human rights advocacy for a long, long time and done a lot of things. CLM is not supposed to replace this. It's an additional avenue for advocacy to address the same things people have been seeking to improve forever. That was the shortest slide summary ever, wasn't it? And the core principle of CLM is really aligned with nothing about us without us. It's community-led and community-owned. And ideally, it should build power and capacity among communities and enable them to further or continue or start using data to support advocacy, really reinforce accountability, improve healthcare and policies, and uphold human rights. So CLM projects require a lot of things that I'm deliberately not going to discuss like governance, reporting, data collection, data protection, and data analysis. But there are lots and lots of resources that will offer guidance in that area. And to me, the most important aspect of CLM is that it is based on the advocacy priorities, outcomes, and changes that pe people who use drugs want to see in services and policies. And it's not about randomly sending people out to count pills or other things. It's really about communities ensuring that they have access to quality harm reduction and other health services. So my role was really to start by saying, hey, look, this is what the World Health Organization is recommending. This is what your national Government is recommending if there are policies and first to say, are these aligned? Well, if they're not, there is some advocacy right there. You can say to your government, look, WHO recommends this. Why aren't we doing it? But also the average person always knows when their rights are being violated or when they're being treated badly, but they may not be aware of global guidelines, standards, and recommendations. So it's a really good place to start. 
And CLM projects really should sh be shaped according to advocacy, go advocacy goals from the very beginning. And it relies on questions which are called indicators. And these are built around advocacy areas. And qualitative questions are about a person's experience. Those, so they should never be yes or no. Like, did you have a good experience at your needle syringe program? Rather than what has your experience been like? So people will really tell you things. And quantitative indicators are about numbers, such as maybe the number of syringes that people want or need versus the number that they're actually given. That's sort of a little preview into the technical aspects or how to take the basic things that people care about and put them into this mechanism. I think the most important point of this is how much context matters. CLM has mostly been for HIV and some for TB and some for malaria, but they're usually conducted in healthcare facilities. And there are a lot of things to think about when people who use drugs are doing a CLM project, such as their safety, confidentiality, and the power imbalances. Some services that people will be monitoring can be punitive and retaliated against people that they don't feel like are a welcome presence. And many places have been really not welcoming environments for people who use drugs. So the first thing to think about is who should monitor these programs. If it's someone who's a stranger to the community coming in, there may be very legitimate trust issues. If it's a member of community, what will that person need to feel supported and safe to do this work? Um, if it's a program or service beneficiary, what will they need to feel safe and supported? And what will be needed to create trust around the process? And where should you do the monitoring? What's a safe, secure, and welcoming space that offers privacy, et cetera? And what are the concerns of the people who participate in interviews, surveys, and focus groups? And what do they need to make sure their safety and confidentiality are protected? And I certainly don't have the answers, nor should I be providing them. These need to come directly from the community themselves. But they're really important things to consider. And thank you. That was my last slide. Thank you, Tracy. That was great and really good to get that kind of overview and some key points around CLM, what it is, what it isn't, how it works, and some of the things we might need to be keeping in mind when we're particularly talking about CLM with people who use drugs um, rather than other key populations. So I'm going to keep moving on with speakers at this point, and I'd uh, like to introduce Angela McBride. Angela is the executive director of SAMPUD, the South African Network of People Who Use Drugs. Um, and Angela's going to talk uh, to us about experiences of CLM in South Africa and just some of their lessons and learnings, uh, challenges and outcomes. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annie, and thank you to everyone so far. Um, I'm just going to babble a little bit until my slides can pop up in the background. Um, so just to give a little bit of an overview, um, in South Africa, CLM is relatively new, even though um, it was meant to be, ah, there we go, um, a part. Um, it was meant to start a, a while ago. However, it's only really now starting to take or kick off. May I use this big thing? Thank you. <laughs> um, just a little bit um, of some noteworthy things um, that came out so far with the CRM and SA. Um, and I'm, I'm probably going to be uh, repeating some things, which is interesting because repetition is one of the, the frustrations of uh, some of CRM. Um, but in SA, we are currently working with um, grassroots organizations to implement CLM. Um, the CLM that is expected of us is currently five survey tools, <laughs> um, really. Uh, 
and they're each probably in the region of about between 50 to about 80 questions. Um, and unfortunately, a few of those tools are not reflective of the needs of the community and even um, relating to the community at all. Um, a lot of the time it's felt like just data capturing, so collecting as much information as possible, interviewing hundreds of people and asking hundreds of questions, and then, yeah, like previously said, it just ends up on someone's desk or in the bin, um, and there's no actual change. I don't want to speak too, like vent too much or be too negative, because there are small, tiny, little allocations of budgets for advocacy um, and addressing advocacy issues. Um, but again, the bulk of the budgets firstly are like dictated to us. Um, but again, it's just such a, so important to acknowledge that there needs to be a support and a mechanism for pushing back on things like this. Um, pushing back on micromanaging and punitive approaches, um, which ultimately just counter the productivity. Um, and the possibility of CLM being something really beautiful, because ultimately that's what it's meant to be. Um, it's meant to be simple, it's meant to be easy, so that anyone can actually do it, especially grassroots community-led organizations, organizations based in the community who are able to, to effectively speak and find out what could be better. Um, it's always good to look at starting small, and that's what we've tried to do, even though there has been pressure of you know, implements and do it now in as many of these spaces and districts and so forth, but it hasn't worked, at least with other activities we've seen over time. Um, sometimes if it's too big, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit so well and things fall apart. Um, so it's always better to start small and build up. Um, I love what was said earlier, and I love that it was again repeated, is um, that community should have the primary say, um, especially on what to monitor, where to monitor. Um, for example, with us, we had to push back and, and make quite a bit of, make things a little bit uncomfortable so that we could evaluate harm reduction centers because originally we were, well, yeah, we were expected to go into public health facilities all across the different districts and ask general population patients and, and clients questions. And for example, those questionnaires, that one in particular, out of about 80 questions, had one question related to harm reduction. And yeah, one. So that, 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 that's, that, that's not so great. And ultimately, when it comes to, if, you, if we're able to start small, we're able to pilot, we're able to practice the tools and pull out what needs to be adjusted, identify what needs to be adjusted. Um, and, and, and again, just being able to ask, you know, the person you're interviewing, uh, honestly, like, do you think this question is valid? Because again, it's meant to be community led. And if I'm interviewing a person who uses drugs, if he, she, they, however they choose to identify says, I don't think this is relevant, it shouldn't be included. It, but we've also got to look at having the tools, and what was really cool is we have quite a good support structure within the, um, the PWID uh, program within Global Fund. We have actually, like the service providers are, are really supportive and really inclusive, and you know, being able to share the tools, pre pre share the tools before even implementing, get getting their input as well on it makes a big difference. Having a informal sector made up of people who use drugs, um, also sharing the tools, sharing the processes with them, the service providers, and obviously the community. We're able to adjust, adapt, and make it better. This is also why we want to try and avoid having it too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, the more complicated it is, the harder it is to adjust. And like I said previously, if we're gonna be asking people questions and we're gonna ask the question of, do you think this is valid or not? Do you think this question applies or not? 
if it's a really complicated structure or system or mechanism, it's really hard to change those questions and that's exactly what has happened. Um, we have made some suggestions to change certain things, but unfortunately there is this app that is being used um, and the response is we can't change it because you can't change it on the app. So this as a result creates confusion. It's harder to be used um, within the community. A lot of the time the language also used is quite high level academic. Um, forgetting a country context. In South Africa, we're really, really lucky. I think we've got 11, I think 12 now official languages and all of the tools are in English and higher grade English as well. I struggle as well. I know a lot of people who do and that's not helpful. And then adding a, an app uh, instead of using something like SurveyMonkey or even better, just a a piece of paper, right, and a database, it, 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 it kind of, it makes it complicated. So in short, we want to keep it simple, familiar, and if possible, just don't develop an app. <laughs> um, so thoughts through with practice. So what was also really cool is we, uh, we took the tools and we met up and had, um, if anyone knows, this is Koketsu. Um, he has also uh, been a big part of the hepatitis C movement. Oh wait, actually, can I go back? Oh, that, that, that woman sitting at the back with her glasses on, that's Natalie Jacobs. She was meant to be here, but her visa was um, denied, which again is such a clear example of the need for decriminalization. I'm sorry, I got off topic. I just wanted to add that five cents. So she is here in spirit. Um, but also some thoughts is when we did this um, induction, going through the tools, evaluating the tools, um, you know, we, we it, it was really interesting because we were able to practice not only with each other, but after engaging with one of the um, service harm reduction service providers in the area, we, within a week we were starting to collect info, we were doing the surveys. And wh why that's so amazing, it's, it's just to reiterate that we need to, it is so important to have support from our service providers. It's not supposed to be an attack. It's not supposed to be a witch hunt. We're not here to tell you that you're doing a terrible job. Okay, some people may be, but that's not the best way to approach it. It's not about like, this is bad, you're terrible, you suck. It should more be like, how can we improve? How can we work together and make it better? Because ultimately, if you're fighting, no one's, if you, yeah, if, if everybody's shouting, nobody's listening. So. Better to always come from an approach of what's going well um, and how can it be imp like pushed and, and more of the going well part. And then what can be improved. Um, it's not supposed to be people use drugs versus service providers. It's supposed to be us versus the challenges, us together versus the challenges that people use drugs face. Um, also something that we noticed, and it's always like something to, to be aware of, is the staff, the people working in the harm reduction programs, they're also people too. Um, yes, a, a fair amount of them may be peers, but if a nurse is burnt out, she, yeah, I'm also speaking from experience. If someone is burnt out, they've been working multiple hours, and it's really, really hard to be empathetic and compassionate and kind all the time. And if we're coming from this attack mode, if we're coming from the space of you're doing something wrong and how bad is, you know, how bad is this organization, we're not acknowledging, you know, that, that some people might be tired. So what's also quite cool is like being able to say, let's dedicate some time and effort to start, find out what, what's up with you? Like, what are some of the needs that you have as a serve, as a peer? my bad, as a service provider, um, how can we work together to, again, make your life a little bit easier? Because if your life is easier, my life is easier. Um, and yeah, like if the tools are too long, dense and repetitive, yeah, it kind of generates a massive amount of data. And again, how does it, how is it used? How is it consolidated? How is it reported, presented? I'm not a number, but when work, when CLM and any work actually is target based and target driven, all I become is a number. So in short, 
tools like these, tools that are detailed, dense, repetitive, need to be revised, re reduced, and fine-tuned to better reflect our community rather than this one-size-fits-all, cookie-cutter, someone said earlier, um, approach. Um, we can acknowledge intersectionality 100%, we have to, but we also can't stray too far away from the fact that our focus is people use drugs and loving and supporting people use drugs. Last but not least, why is this, you know, there we go. So in closing, um, our approach needs to be one of working together as people use drugs networks, data collectors, and home reduction services, and, 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 looking at how we can better support one another, and as a result, improve the lives of our community. Thank you. Great. Th again, thank you, Angela. It's really, um, it was really excellent to get down to sort of some of the direct experiences of the community and doing this work. And I really appreciated your comments around working more with, with implementers and service providers and how you might think about those issues. Because I think that's really a critical aspect of CLM that perhaps doesn't get sort of enough discussion and we might return to that theme in the discussion. So I'm going to introduce, hopefully we can hear Anidi properly, we may have to bring the volume up, but in the meantime I'm going to introduce Anidi. Anidi Akpan, uh, he was meant to be a speaker here today in person but wasn't able to get his visa, so um, we've got, uh, and he's generously agreed to continue in the session and participate virtually, so it's really great to have Anidi Akpan here. Anidi is from DAPTO in Nigeria. And Anidi, um, maybe just to sort of go to you initially to make some opening comments uh, just about your experience for your community in Nigeria around doing CLM. Um, what's your experience been? Maybe some of the challenges and some of the benefits and outcomes. Yeah, it'd be great to hear your experience. Over to you. So maybe in the meantime, if that works. So yeah, if you would just send him a text to, to tell where we, where we stand and try to get him involved through the, through the intro app. In this, maybe in the, in the meantime, we will um, yeah, bring the similar question to you, Judy, if maybe from your end, you can first jump in and um, yeah, talk about the guideline of, of input and, and particularly why you've developed a specific guide for um, the community of people who use drugs. Hello. Sure, thanks Ernst, and I wish I'd been better prepared to prepare a slide showing off our beautiful guide on community-led monitoring for people who use drugs, but it is on the first page of our website and featured on our website. So the guide is called Community-Led Monitoring for People Who Use Drugs, and we wanted to develop it because we saw a gap in existing resources targeted specifically for people who use drugs and harm reduction services. So we know, and as mentioned before, CLM has become a buzzword and there are a million and one guides out there and Keith uh, Menos also pointed to before, you know, ITPC have a repository of all the tools out there, um, but there hadn't been a specific kind of how-to guidance on, you know, how to do community-led monitoring um, as a community member, as a network of people who use drugs. And, you know, as other speakers have mentioned before, you know, CLM isn't new. Um, networks, communities of people who use drugs have been doing CLM for decades. Um, but CLM at this moment, it's gained a lot more traction. Um, it's definitely become more complex, as Angie was sharing, also and more institutionalized. You know, I think with this, there's both, you know, it's both a good and a bad thing, obviously. Um, the good part, of course, is that there's more resources, more political attention to it, and I think, you know, we can as communities try and work out how to harness this opportunity. So we produced, we launched this guide probably, I think it was last week, um, on a webinar. It was very well attended, like about 60, 60 people who use drugs attended. I think 180 people who use drugs had registered. And it really showed, you know, that there's a lot of kind of community interest, you know, in how to, you know, how to start, um, initiate CLM, how to make sure, net, you know, networks are reaching communities directly and how to be able to shape it in the ways that we want. So this guide was written by Tracy Swan, very much as our consultant. Um, 
And you know, we really, when we were looking at doing this guide, we wanted to provide, provide guidance on how to do CLM in ways that would increase the chances that the data, you know, produced can be used to influence service and services and programs. Um, because we hear, you know, a lot that CLM data is sometimes not taken seriously or data produced by the community simply because it is done by the community. And so as we saw, you know, the framework of CLM becoming, you know, more and more complex and standardized, I think it was also like, you know, how do we try and keep up, you know, a bit with that as well, um, but also, you know, provide tips in there on, you know, how to navigate and, you know, also try and negotiate to make sure that, you know, community are the ones, you know, setting the indicators because it is, you know, it is named community led for a reason. Um, but also in this guide, you know, there's also advocate, advocacy tips and strategies on how to, you know, maximize the influence of this data and how to build advocacy and, ba and basically just use this data to justify the need for policy and program shifts as well. Sorry, we're discussing at the same time if we can do anything on the technical issues. Um, thank you very much, Judy. Um, I, we're now getting into the phase where we will have question and answers. At, at the same time, we will keep trying to keep our colleague from um, yeah, Nigeria in, involved. It's always, yeah, it underlines again how complicated it is to get people from all over the world involved in this. We really try to do it online. Sometimes it works, sometimes we run into issues. Um, I hope we can still give them the opportunity as well to speak. But this is the moment when we also really want to bring it to you, to the floor, or any questions or any experiences from the room on the CLM. Um, because we really see this as, as a mechanism emerging, but we also heard that still it is quite, maybe not so well understood yet. And I think that we all really need to understand which way we're heading um, to, to really make this, make this a, a, a structural intervention in every um, intervention. So, Nicholas? Yes, thanks. Uh, great <coughs> presentations. I'm really unknowledgeable about this, but I remember that like 15 or 10 years ago in Congo, uh, Médecins du Monde started that for HIV programs. And what I remember was that the community brought incredibly valuable data and reports back but the reporting back was unclear and how it actually led to change. So basically my question is, I don't know if you have anything, Angela or others, from your experience, you know, what are good examples on, you know, what you monitor, how do you bring it back and how do you actually translate it into change in terms of mechanisms um, without making it too heavy but effective? So one of the models that I've worked within builds in a level of stakeholder engagement as the process is starting. So people from healthcare facilities, ministries of health, academia, as well as the community are brought together to look at all the data that's been gathered and figure out what to do about it. However, one of the drawbacks of CLM is the same people that ignored us before might continue to ignore us. I think one leverage it gives us is like, hey, come on, don't, don't you get any money from Global Fund? Like, they're paying for this, or Unitaid, or whatever funder UN aids, like, that should give us some more stature to sort of prevent, present the findings. And I think Angie was dead on when she said, you're not supposed to come in and say, hey, we're here to spy on you because we know you're doing a terrible job. I think that collaboration is important, but I think the advocacy has, like the plans, the campaigns, everything, that should be at the beginning when the community starts this. And I really feel for you having to use tools that someone else developed because that's what the community is supposed to do, not anybody else. 
And if you really get everybody together and say, what's the most impact we can have with this? How do we use it? Who do we want to work with? Do we have, I think, the best strategy inside, outside, where you have people who are at the stakeholder meetings and you have a bunch of people that are like, yeah, I'm really mad. I'll stand out outside and hold a sign. And you do both. So I don't think it's the answer to fixing everything. It's just an avenue to go through it. And I hope that wasn't a really unsatisfying answer. But I think you're correct as in, you know, I think we need to look at this stage, like how can we already be planning to document, you know, the results and document the steps, you know, that got us there. And I would say, you know, because a lot of this is funded through the Global Fund, you know, you would envisage that, you know, the data produced by the community and, you know, Global Fund funding the CLM, that that can be brought um, to the CCM to be able to, you know, present. And I know there's a lot of also background work in doing capacity building of CCM members, you know, government representatives, um, your technical partners, et cetera, to really, you know, elevate the value of CLM. So I know that's obviously also a long-term process, but that is happening now. Yeah, I also have a couple of thoughts. Like first two examples and then like a thought. Um, a practical example from Russia, I remember back in, probably it was 2010 or 2011, uh, when this uh, drug procurement monitoring started, the community uh, has found out that in Russia, the, at the day, the only registered brand drug, uh, Lamivudin Zidovudin, under the brand name Kivexa, was sold in Russia uh, more expensive than in Great Britain. Um, and that allowed, this particular comparison allowed to start the whole big campaign in media targeting pharma to drop the price down and also in parallel to talk about the need of registering generics and, you know, to, to cover more people with treatment. Second example, hepatitis, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, also uh, the fact that they were monitoring the prices within the like existing like registration and stuff like that. It was allowing them to raise the argument about the accessibility of sofosbuvir both for the government, but at the same time to target pharma with advocacy campaigns. And, and they were able to, to work together with the government because the government was very interested to drop the price to minimize the budget cost for the hepatitis program. Uh, and the general thought is that I think it really depends on the country you're working in, because if we are talking like the, like, okay, let's say the developed democracies, least developed democracies and oppressive governments, we, we, we are going to have a very different target for our CLM. The, the well-developed democracies, they are willing to hear about the issues within the healthcare system because they want to optimize costs, they understand the whole idea of getting back from your your citizens. The least developed democracies, they are not so open. And in the first case, you can speak about ensuring sustainability by even providing some government funding through the independent, you know, resources and get it more sustainable. In, in the second case, government would say, okay, we are paying for that. We don't want you to criticize our work. And, and for the oppressive governments, I mean, the, 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 the the aim of the community-led monitoring is often just to, to tell the truth to, to people, you know. That's how I look at it. Can I make a comment? Okay. I don't Sorry. think I can say something. Hello? Uh, please, um... Hello? Yes, we can hear you. If we would just... One second, and then we'll come to you. I think there's just one conversation ongoing now. Exactly. If maybe, perhaps, Niklas, you had one comment, and Angela, if you want to answer. And uh, I've noted there's somebody else. Yes, thank you. So was, first, Niklas, and then I'll come to Anita. Just a tiny comment. I actually don't think that there's much community-led com monitoring in, how did you call them, developed or the more democratic democracies. I mean, maybe in harm reduction a little bit, but in the healthcare system, in psychiatry, for example, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. There are some patient groups that have no influence whatsoever, very honestly, at least in Germany, for example. I've never seen strong community-led monitoring. So this fantasy that, I mean, you know, uh, could be that 
sometimes there's even less community-led monitoring in high-income countries or democracies. Thank you. Maybe just, Angelit, would you like to add something to this ongoing discussion? What to do about how the feedback is going to be picked up? Because I thought you had some great examples. No, you're good? Excellent. Okay, Anidi, if you can still hear us, we're still trying. Houston, can you reach me? There's the delay, it's, you know, it's going to the spaceship. Okay. I'm then going to take the question from the back in the room and we will keep trying in the last 10 minutes as it goes. Hello. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not actually going to ask a question, but I'm really amazed with what I'm seeing here, especially from Angela. The trajectory she used in getting up to where she is in the community-led monitoring, the voice of the community, how they move from one point to the other, and how they are able to impact on whatever they were doing is really amazing. And one thing has come out clearly that um, there's a lot of funding going to regional networks, but we seem not to have some data collections that would actually inform the work we are doing. So I appreciate if after this meeting she could share the slide of this presentation with other regional networks for us to replicate what she's doing, because we seem to look at it as if it's a war in the country, but the language is simple, the movement is simple, and everything moving gradually to where she gets to. So it really get me a mess, and I believe that if this is replicated in other countries or regional network, we're going to get something more positive. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that is an excellent suggestion. Is there any other questions from the room that we can take on? Thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. Uh, CLM is new for me. and. My question is maybe more for the high-level folks of, and I appreciate the need for community leadership in, in the collection of data, but I'm also interested in how you compare across locations, and so how do you handle the tension between information that's not collected maybe consistently, and what, what, what do you do if you want to say that things are different in different parts of a country or in different countries if the, the data collected is really not kind of consistent? Anyone want to particularly pick this up, this question? I, s I saw you nodding, Dennis, no? Judy, okay. Yeah, uh, I can start. So one thing is, uh, in our case, sometimes we try to develop like a simple tool that will help to, you know, structure it. But again, I, I want to echo what my colleagues have said. We always need to remember our audience and like the way we inform them about these tools. We either, you know, we, we make things like guerrilla marketing. Like, you know, we put with the spray on the walls of the clinics, like the address of the website or the telephone of the counselor with a question, you were denied treatment, call. And then they just can dial and then the person will talk and he is already trained and aware how to put the thing just to make sure he's getting the information in the way that we will be able to compare with other regions. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes, of, yeah, we get it in chunks and bits and then the role of us as an organization or umbrella organization, a regional network, is to really try to describe it and use our connections to put it to media and, you know, to showcase that the, the that this problem is not a single case, but it's systemic. It just shows in different regions, uh, in different ways. Yeah, I was just actually gonna turn to you, Angela, because you're in a national network, so um, just thinking, yeah, how is it being standardized across? I imagine that's part of the struggle as well, that it is so being standardized that it's not, you know, always suitable. <laughs> Um, and I also thought maybe Needy may have some insights as well if he's able to come in because I know they're working also across other key populations and people living with HIV to create one big CLM framework in interest of standardization, but I think there are struggles. 
Thanks, Judy. Um, I think as well, I, uh, when it comes to like standardization, even like that um, across countries, almost in a way, um, what my brain always goes to is it's also, it's supposed to be impactful to the community within the country. So when it comes to like standardizing, we also need to remember the country context aspect and how this is meant to be packaged, phrased, done in a way that can be, that will benefit the country that in that country, the people in the country. Um, also when it comes to the standardization, I mean, it's, it's quite challenging, especially in SA, because it's literally a universal CLM tool. So, no, it is so frustrating. So, for example, all the other KP um, sectors and, and, and um, CLM, or, uh, gosh, word. The other KP organization or KP groups doing CLM, we all literally have the owner of the same one. There's a facility manager one, an observation one, a data capture one, a patient one, and then we're lucky, and then you have one KP one, which is people who use drugs, or they might be a sex worker um, tool as well, and each of them have 100 something questions, and, and, and that is so problematic, because like I said previously in, in the presentation as well, is that like the patient survey is a whole bunch of questions and only one relates to harm reduction. So again, it's taking up time, it's taking up effort, it's even, like even here, it's taking up air time talking about it, where we could be talking about something a lot richer. But then again, this is also great because it lessons learned sort of vibe, but it's just, it, it doesn't work to standardize and, and even, even within country, you know, um, because they may and they are aspects, even, even provincial. I mean, we know in South Africa, uh, things can be very different based on where you're at. Um, in Durban, there may be different questions that need to be asked than in Cape Town. Um, for example, in Durban, the needle syringe um, program was shut down for a good couple of years and it took a lot of advocacy um, and a lot of work to get that up and going again. And like, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have Durban CLM focus on something like that. Like, what was the impact? What was it like? But that's not the case, you know, because also we're not, we can't do that. They give us the questionnaire and they say, go do it. And the closest thing we can do is change the general people use drug survey. We wouldn't be able to do the subsections. And even that, it gets tricky. So that's where it really needs to be CLM, global cool, regional cool, sub-regional cool, national cool, but then we actually need to break it down further. But that's not a, that's like a long-term dream sort of vibe. And again, then, you know, addressing the advocacy issues that come out of each district. Again, you can't throw a blanket over and say, oh, nationally, um, uh, they are, oh, yeah, UK, okay, of course, like it'll be like nationally, we need more needles and syringes. But in fact, in Durban, it may be we need more um, safe stimulant packs. We need stimulant packs. And in Cape Town, it may be we need more women's fo uh, focused uh, services. So again, it's not bulking all. You need to also look beyond that and at the different, in the different specific context. Okay, I'm sorry for babbling. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. I think that, that we're getting to the end of the session, but it leads quite nicely into a, a last pending question that I, that I had. When you were talking about all these diff different layers, I, I think we've heard of the different stakeholders, like the general groups that are involved. You've, you've got the government, you've got donors, the implementers, and community, and I'm sure that we can come up with others, but these seems to be the main stakeholders. Now, I wanted to ask to all of you to, what would you say to each of those different stakeholders to convince them to pick up community lab monitoring, and not on a very tokenistic way, as, as Nicolas already referred to. It is very easy to do in theory, but what is in their interest? Why would this be an interest for them? But we don't have enough time, so I will just pick the government to you, Dennis. What would you tell the government to convince them to pick up community lab monitoring? Then Tracy, after that, I'll give you the bag of money, you're the donor. What, what would you say to a donor to pick up community-led monitoring? And then Ansel as an implementer and Judy from the community. Thank you. CLM can help you spend your money more effectively. 
I think Angela just gave us an example of DLM, donor-led monitoring, not CLM. So I think donors, as a donor, I would like to say, I don't know what your community needs, and I think you know more about that than I do. Here's some money, go do it. I love that, so yeah, please have some money. No. Um, actually, I guess that would be. Um, and yeah, and, and what's a PC way of saying this? Um, shut up, sit down, and listen, really. And give us money, just direct, let us do it. As implementers, let us do it. I think that was the question, right? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Intimidate to start it, you've got to start somewhere and, you know, um, make sure that you get your priorities in there, kind of take the power back. Remember you have power. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this. So from my end, I'm going to apologize again for technicalities. Um, thank you very much. I've understood a lot better. I'll hand it over to Annie to close. Yeah, look, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our fabulous speakers. They've really shared some really amazing information with us, I think, about different aspects and perspectives on CLM and their experiences. You know, it is very, in some ways, early days, you know, particularly in relation to people who use drugs, and there's a lot of learning to do uh, from those communities who have already started working in these areas. But um, I do have to apologise very profusely to our colleague, Anidi, um, in Nigeria, it's just so terrible that we weren't able to get him online and want to thank him for spending time to actually try and make it work. Sometimes the technology just fails us, I'm afraid. But thank you, all of you. Please join me in thanking the speakers. Thank you for coming along to the session. I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, please stay in touch with our speakers for further information. <laughs>